Hey everybody, I'm Steve. And I'm Nicole. Welcome to our new YouTube channel. So for our very first video ever, we thought we would load up a presentation that we did for a group in England. It was a one-of-a-kind presentation that we did custom for them. It came out pretty good, so we thought we'd share it with everybody. So we've got that, and we've got so much more coming on the new channel. What else do we have coming, Nicole? Oh, it's going to be good. We're going to be doing some how-to videos. We're going to show some of the gear that we use. We'll do check-ins from the field on our different adventures and all kinds of other fun stuff. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss a thing. And check out this exciting new splash video introduction we have coming up. Thanks. <music>I am going to go ahead and share my screen and get this party started. All right. Does everything look good over there, Nicole? Yes, yep. it does. Yep. Okay. All right. I need to center myself so I can do this in a proper fashion. So first of all, thank you very much for your patience. I apologize. That is completely our fault. Um, so my name is Steve Gettle, that lovely vision over there who actually just ran out of the shower to come out here be with you <laughs> folks, is my sweet Nicole. We are professional nature photographers. We're from Michigan. And uh, we do everything in nature. We do birds, we do mammals, we do insects, we do landscapes. We do If we can find ourselves outside, we can usually find something to take a picture of. Um, I've been doing it for 30 years. Nicole's been doing it for 20. We're lucky enough to make our, our living as nature photographers. Uh, I have an agent who sells things to books and magazines and calendars. And uh, Nicole and I lead photo tours and workshops all over the world. Um, so one of the things you should understand before I get rolling on this is I've been doing this for a long time and, and I shoot digitally like I shot slides I, like I shot film I try to do everything in the camera I'm not a big Photoshop guy um, of course I post process my images but literally I spend 12 or 15 seconds moving a couple sliders around all right that's just my process all right and and part of it is laziness we shoot a lot I don't have time to you know if I send something to my agent I have to process it and you know we shoot hundreds of thousands of images a year so we process a lot of images so I don't really have time to make love to all of my images so, mm -hmm. but I work hard to get them right in the camera. Did I miss anything, Nicole? No, I think that's good. Okay. All right, so this is kind of a cool program for us. We've been doing these Zoom presentations all over the world for, for a few months, and this is the first time zone hiccup we've had. Um, <laughs> but this is kind of a fun one for us because we're doing something custom just for you guys. It's called the story behind the images. And what we've done is you guys, I don't know who did it, but someone picked out a bunch of images and, and asked us to talk about how we made all of those images. And not surprisingly, a... Uh, a lot of the images that you chose were some of the more complex and complicated and convoluted images that we made and more technical images, which is going to make it interesting. So um, what I've done, and I had a hard time kind of figuring out how to put this together into a cohesive whole for a program. So um, what I've done is I've added a half a dozen, a dozen images to it, and I put it into kind of a theme. And the theme is finding our vision, right? And, you know, we all start off as photographers. Basically, we probably all start off the same way, right? Drawing a, a rectangle around a pretty part of the world and pushing a button, right? As we grow, we want to be able to change lenses. We want to have more effect on the image by using different shutter speeds and different apertures. And usually we start emulating other photographers and we grow. And as we grow... Hopefully we develop our own style and our own way of seeing the world and, and making pictures, right? And so that's what I'm gonna talk about today is the, the path that we take as we try to find our own vision. And um, I'd like this, Nicole and I would like this to be very interactive. So Nicole explained how to ask questions, is that right, Nicole? So please ask questions. This is gonna be a lot more interesting if we have kind of a give and take. 
All right. So don't be shy. I'm going to pause every once in a while, ask Nicole if there's questions. If there's something that's very pertinent and timely to the, to the image that's up or the image we just passed, Nicole will feel free to interrupt me. Um, usually we send out notes after all of our presentations because they're more educational based. This is kind of a, a, a hybrid. So what we're going to do is we're going to send out a set of notes to everybody and there'll be some information in there, but there'll also be links to a lot of blog posts and Facebook posts and things that take a deeper dive into the different techniques and different things that we talk about today. So like if the snowflake section sounds really interesting to you and you wanna try that, there'll be a link there to tell you exactly how to, how to do that kind of photography. So, do we have any questions before I get rolling? Okay. All right. One of my goals as a nature photographer, one of the things I love about nature photography is I like trying to figure out solving the puzzles of how to get the pictures I have in my head. And that's one of the challenges that I have as a photographer. I, people are surprised to hear that I pre-visualize a lot of the photographs that I make. And so one of my challenges is try to make the pictures I have in my head. And the other thing I'm always trying to do is trying to show people something that they haven't seen before. And that's becoming harder and harder because man, there are a lot of great photographers out there. Since the advent of digital photography, photography has just exploded and there's so many awesome pictures being made. So I'm having to push things further and further and further trying to make different images. And I use all kinds of different technical things and setups and all kinds of things to make the pictures I have in my head. So that's what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about some of the things that, that we do to make different pictures and to try to find our own creative vision. All righty. So our tools. All right. Photography is, a, is an unusual medium in that you know, we have, there's a technical aspect of things and there's a creative aspect of things. And our tools are really one of the technical aspects of things, different lenses, managing our shutter speed and our f-stop and all the different variables to make a proper exposure. That's all the technical side. So, so knowing our tools is really the technical part of photography in a lot of ways. Okay, here's an image of a gannet, uh, northern gannet flying and this is exactly how it looked out of the picture and it, out of the camera and this is exactly the picture i wanted to make this is what i envisioned when i when i was making this picture all right so one of the things we need to do is we need to be able to manage our exposure in difficult lighting situations all right so what's going on here he's flying in full sun and behind him is a deeply shaded part of a cliff face and when i expose properly for this bird in the sun, that shaded part of the cliff goes completely black, right? A tricky exposure, but that's one of the things we need to be able to do as we're, uh, as we're photograph making pictures is we need to handle these tricky lighting conditions and be able to, to make successful images like this, all right? And the trick to this is just shooting a manual, right? I, I manually set my exposure for the bird, make sure I'm not blowing out the highlights and let the background go where it goes. And in this instance, it's going, totally black. Okay, in nature photography, um, a lot of things happen very quickly, right? We need to be able to manage our composition. We need to be able to zoom effectively. We need to be able to, to move our, uh, our autofocus point where it needs to be. We need to do these things quickly and efficiently so we can get that decisive moment because things happen and change quickly. Okay, one of the challenges of photography is we're a two-dimensional medium in a three-dimensional world, okay? And, you know, for a lot of our images, we're trying to give the impression of that third dimension. For this image, I went in a completely different way. I, I decided to embrace the two-dimensional aspect, and I used a telephoto lens to compress this image to visually stack up the elements in this picture, okay? I made this image with a 400 millimeter lens, all right? 
larger telephotos compress things in the image. People are surprised to hear that the, the distance between the foreground and this and the back is about 15 feet. Okay, but because I chose a telephoto lens and a, a, a small aperture of f22, it visually compressed that and stacked it all up and really changed the way that picture looked. Okay, for this image, this is a polyphemus moth, and I made the other choice. I, I went with a wide angle macro lens to give this a more broad view and to put this moth in its habitat. Right, and these are creative choices that we as artists make to, to bring our own creative vision to our photography. And that's always the goal of my photography is to make the pictures I have in my head, right? To bring my own creative vision to, to, to my work. Okay, here's a fish eagle from Kenya. He's going in to grab a fish. Obviously I made a choice here to stop the action, right? Shooting a fast enough shutter speed you know, this is probably a 1250th of a second or more fast enough to stop the action, right? I'm shooting at a very fast frame rate. My, my camera takes 14 frames a second to get that very penal, that ultimate peak action, that, that decisive moment just before he grabs the fish, right? The more frames per, per second we can throw at it, the more likely you are to get that peak action. Okay, here I've made the opposite choice. Right, we're still photographing action, but in this case, I chose to handle it in a more painterly fashion. Right, I drag the shutter, I'm shooting a slower shutter speed and panning with this fox as he's running. Right, and that just blurs the background and blurs him. You know, his face is relatively sharp, but it just gives more of a sense of movement and handles it in a more painterly, painterly fashion. Right, so these are all creative choices that we make using the tools we get and understanding how they work to bring our own vision to our work. All right, how are we doing on questions, Nicole? I see no questions just yet. All right. Can I ask a question, Steve? A absolutely, yeah. please do. Yeah. And when feel free, you guys gannet, can't use, go ahead. Yeah, when I first saw the gannet, I thought it was carrying a string of Christmas lights. <laughs> And when I looked closer, I realized it was seaweed. Yeah, he's bringing, uh, bringing some flowers back to his lady. <laughs> good boy. Yeah. He's a good boy. They're, they're very romantic, those gannets. Seaweed works for them. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so, so uh, Ralph and Steve, you guys, you guys can't tap, type into the, the question box, so feel free to interrupt at any point if you have a question. You're not going to screw me up at all. Okay, thanks. Yep, no worries. Oh, look at Nicole. She just got a question. Dude. I can tell. <laughs> Richard so is asking. Um, yeah, so a question from Richard. He's asking, do you always use manual? Manual focus or manual exposure? Manual exposure. I'm, assume, I'm going to assume you're talking about manual exposure. Um, no, actually, I, when I shot slides, when I shot film, I shot manual all the time. I shot spot metering and manual exposure. The reason was was I didn't have the facility to check my exposure, right? So I had to, you know, dissect the scene, get exactly the right exposure. So I used spot meter, manual, set everything up myself because I, I couldn't be off. If I was off by a third of a, a stop, that slide was garbage. It wasn't going to work, okay? Now, since we've got the histogram, which is the greatest thing ever about digital photography, that's freed me up to shoot matrix metering, or Canon calls it evaluative metering, and aperture priority, okay? And um, the reason I shoot that now is because I have the histogram and I can check to make sure the camera's doing what I want it to do, and then I can use exposure compensation to, to you know, correct things if I need to, but it's faster, right? If I'm in peekaboo light and the sun's coming in and out of the clouds, and the light's changing, if I don't, you know, I can shoot an aperture priority and not have to be re-metering every 12 seconds, right? But that being said, manual is a super important tool, and I still shoot a manual fairly often, especially for birds in flight, when I'm doing silhouettes, things like that, I, I shoot a manual. And when I shoot a manual, I shoot spot meter, all right? And I still use the histogram, right? So when I took the meter reading off of that, when I was shooting those gannets, there were 70,000 gannets in the air, by the way. So I was shooting a lot of gannets. So I set my meter 
and I checked the histogram to make sure I wasn't blowing out the highlights, right? The histogram is a tool, whether you're shooting in a program mode or manual, right? It's a, it's a easy, great check. Great question. Okay. So vision, right? Vision is more of the artistry of photography, right? This comes from knowing how our camera's gonna translate the image before us, how the settings that we input into the camera and how the situation is gonna be translated, right? So this comes a lot from experience, from knowing what the different settings are gonna do to, to create the vision, the image that you wanna make. All right, so here's a quick example. A, uh, a great horned owl. What's going on here is kind of a, a different picture. I am photographing through some orange leaves, right, that are in front of the bird, and then behind the bird are yellow leaves, all right? I'm shooting a very narrow depth of field. This is probably 2.8, so wide open, and what I want to happen is I want that bird, the, his face to be sharp, but I want all those leaves and all of that to just become an abstracted blur of color right? So photograph, this isn't a happy accident. This is totally designed and thought out. Okay, a Sally Lightfoot crab. I love this picture. One of the reasons I love about it is this beautiful, intimate point of view, this, this intimate perspective. We've put the viewer right in this Sally Lightfoot crabs world, right? By getting down low, I'm laying right down in the sand with my, my camera, <coughs> excuse me, balanced on a rock or on a, on a tripod real low to, to put the viewer right in this, this uh, crabs world. All right, how are we doing on questions, Nicole? It looks like you got something. Yes, we have one question from Graham. He's asking, do you keep everything manual? I set f-stop and speed and use auto ISO. Do you control everything? Um, well, if I'm shooting manual, yes, I, can, I control everything. Um, you know, all the program modes are, you know, you're floating with the program modes, aperture priority, shutter priority, or manual floating the ISO, you're letting the camera make one of those three choices, right? Your f-stop, your shutter speed, or your ISO. All right, so I call those all program modes, right? And floating the aperture or floating the ISO is a totally valid way to shoot. It's not something that I do, um, but I know a lot of people that do it very successfully. It's just not the way I work. Um, if you do float your ISO, the one cautionary tale I will tell you is make sure you set your high ISO limit. You don't want your camera defaulting to ISO 32,000 if that's not your intention. So you can set the maximum ISO limit that you're comfortable with. And, and then you can manually override it if you need to, right? Okay, again, anticipation. I call this the, the chess game of nature photography, right? We've got to read the situation, especially when we're doing animals, right? These two elephants were, were bumping heads and they were fighting and pushing each other. And I saw their trunks were all tangled up and as they separated, I, I hoped that I would, this image was going to come out of it, right? So I quickly zoomed out, got the center po focus point and started banging away shots, right? We've got to anticipate what's going to happen, read the situation and get ready to make the image. Okay, silhouettes. Silhouettes require a lot of vision. You have to understand when you look at the scene, it's not going to look like this at all. You have to understand in order to make an effective silhouette, you have to understand how your camera is going to record that scene, right? And, and at its basic level, when you record for the brighter background, the, 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 uh, the foreground elements go into silhouette, right? So they clean, simple uh, subjects that are easily identifiable by their silhouette, right? And uh, really fun, very graphic images to make. Okay, we can do that on a wider scale, all right? This image was totally pre-visualized, all right? I spent nine years photographing a pair of loons up in Northern Michigan, really cool birds. It was really wonderful to spend all that time with them. And I, I went past these reeds all the time. I knew where the sun rose and I knew one day everything would line up and I'd be able to make this picture. And I looked for it every day I look to get myself in this situation to make this picture. And one day, everything kind of came together, 
right? So many, many, many of my images are pre-visualized like this. And as we get further into the program, you're going to find some of the ways that I put myself in situations to make the pictures I have in my head. Okay. Light. One of the things I love playing with is light. This is an image. I call this type of image a light reflection. This is really fun to play with, especially when you're doing fall color on a sunny day. So what's going on here is we've got a shaded section of a waterfall up in Michigan's Northern Peninsula called Bond Falls. And, the, and on the other side of the creek or the river is a yellow maple in full sun. Okay. And that sunlit beautiful yellow maple is reflected in the water in the shaded part of the stream. Okay. So that's where the yellow co color comes from. The blue comes from the sky, right? So it's just lining things up to make the image. And then I dragged my shutter. I'm shooting this as probably one or two second exposure. By dragging the shutter, I get that beautiful milky water effect. And then the other added bonus is it softens the reflection of that maple and makes it more of just an abstract wash of color right? Something super fun to play with. I, I do this a lot, like in the middle of the day when I'm up north doing fall color, something fun to play with. All right. We can do it with wildlife too. Okay. This is an actual photograph. This looks, I know this looks like it's photoshopped. I actually desaturated this because it looks so crazy. Um, but this is the exact same situation. We've got a shaded part of a pond with these beautiful wood ducks sitting there. On the other shore is a sunlit bank of trees with yellows and greens and red. And that sunlit reflection is, is behind the shaded wood ducks. And this is all, I don't even think I did a lot of shadows and highlights to pull this back out. So fun things to play with. Okay, how are we doing on questions, Nicole? Anything? Nope, no questions just yet. All righty. Okay. So one of the other ways to get unique images is investing our time. Okay. Investing our time in our subject, right? You know, you've, you've probably all heard the saying, the harder I work, the luckier I get. Well, the truth is the harder you work, the more often you're out there, the more likely you're going to come across one of those great chances, one of those great opportunities. So the more time we put in, the more reward we're going to get out. Okay. Not only in subjects, right? Putting time in with our gear, right? Knowing which way the f-stop ring turns, which way to zoom, right? Learning how to being able to change your ISO without pulling your eye away from the viewfinder, right? Nicole and I are super lucky. We get to spend time with our cameras virtually every single day, right? So our cameras, are an extension of us. We don't, you know, I very rarely pull my eye away from the viewfinder if I'm in a good scene because I can, I can do all that stuff. But the beauty of that is when we're intimately familiar with our gear, when that elephant pulls apart and we get that chance to make that shot, we can zoom out. We know how to do that. We, we, it just is instinctive. We don't have to think about it, right? So invest time in not only your subject, but also your gear so you know how to, to make those split second decisions when it's time to make them. All right, so here's the situation near a home here in Michigan. Um, we live by this park, and uh, there's this pair of sandhill cranes that have been nesting in this park for four or five years. It's a fairly heavily uh, visited park. So the beautiful thing is these sandhill cranes are acclimated to seeing people, and they're really acclimated to us photographing them because we've been photographing them for years. So this investment of time has paid off a lot. We've seen, I've actually seen probably four sandhill crane chicks hatch, right? Been there the day it hatches, right? Because we know when the eggs are laid, we can, we can figure out uh, with, with a natural history book when the eggs are going to hatch and we can make sure we're there for the couple days when they're going to hatch, right? And then we can get these special intimate moments, right? When they're, when we spend all that time there, this, this little guy, he had hatched, uh, the day before. So at Sandhill, they usually have two eggs. The first ha egg hatches one day, and then the second day, the next egg hatches. So mom's actually sitting on uh, its sibling right there. Okay, and then we can get really beautiful, intimate portraits, right? Unique and different pictures. This is almost an abstract, right? It's all about textures and colors and patterns, right? But the beautiful thing is, go ahead. What photo length was that, uh, Steve? 
That was a 600, and I think I probably had a 1.4 teleconverter on it too. So I'm in there pretty tight. Um, and she was actually sitting on her nest. And she's, you know, she's nesting like eight feet off a trail. So I was actually backing up to try to get, get the shot. But they're really used to seeing people. But the beautiful thing of, of, of this is not only do we get all these great everyday shots, but every once in a while, something really crazy happens like this. So I don't know if you noticed, but that is a gosling with this handheld crane family. So what we think, we're not sure what happened, but this gosling hatched out of the sandhill crane nest. And what we think happened is the female goose was in the midst of laying her eggs. Her nest flooded. She had to dump an egg. She put it in the sandhill crane nest. The sandhill crane, they don't know what it did. They, they just hatched the thing out. And they were probably just as surprised as the rest of us when this little gosling came out. But the beautiful thing is, they raised this little gosling, which had its own set of challenges, of course, because goslings eat plants. They eat, you know, plankton and, and, and you know, uh, seaweed and things like that. Well, sandhill cranes eat grubs and worms and things like this. So they had to teach this gosling how to eat like a sandhill crane. So I call this picture, wait, you want me to eat what? <laughs> so, but he eventually did figure it out and uh he was able although the worm almost did win this battle he he had it pretty wrapped around his bow so invest in that time we get to get in in these special situations and get these special moments and these special unique pictures right all right i can see nicole's got a question yeah we have a question from gary he's Hi. asking are you using a tripod or monopod I am a Nicole and I are tripod people. Um, I, I, I shoot probably, well, some of the flash stuff, I don't use the tripod if I'm using it only flash, but for the most part, we shoot off a tripod. All right. And honestly, a tripod is a pain in the butt. It really is. It, 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 it has cost me pictures. It has gotten in the way. I've been messing with my tripod when, you know, and not been able to get in position that I wanted to get in because my tripod got in the way. But the honest to God, truth of the matter is I've gotten way, 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 way more pictures because I've had a tripod. Okay. It just opens up creative doors that I couldn't do without a tripod. It allows me to shoot and get more depth of field. It allows me to shoot slower shutter speeds. Um, it allows me to shoot longer. You know, if I'm using a big heavy lens, I can't handhold that thing all the time. So it, it just tripod really kicks open a lot of creative doors for me. So it's, it's really an important piece of gear for me. Okay, then we have a question from Graham about our goose, our gosling. Um, will that gosling ever exhibit its own not normal behavior and swim, et cetera? Well, unfortunately, Graham, we don't know. Um, mm -hmm. So it did really well. It lasted like three or four months. It was doing well. It was eating, doing really well. And then it came time to learn how to land. It came time to learn how to fly. Well, goslings don't, or geese don't really, you know, they, they slow down and, and stop. Cranes kind of run to slow down. And his first landing didn't go as well as, as we would have liked, and he didn't make it. And that's what we assume again. But yeah. yeah, he didn't make it. But there have been been instances where this has happened before, and the gosling mm -hmm. has actually migrated with the cranes mm -hmm. and actually, for all intents and purposes, thought he was a sandhill crane. Yeah. So, neat story. Okay, so the other thing we can do is we can take our tools to the next level, push things, right? That's what I'm always trying to do is push things. One of the things Nicole and I love to do is macro photography. Um, this is a green darner, which is a, uh, about a, a pretty large dragonfly, about a four inch dragonfly. And, um, this portrait, it's probably life size, maybe a little, maybe two X, fairly tight close up of this guy. Um, and this is the best picture I can make of this image of this at this magnification with a macro lens. This is F, uh, this is probably a two second exposure at F 22. Okay. I can shoot that long exposure because it's cool enough that this insect is in a state of torpor. So he can't move until he warms up. Okay. But the best picture I can make, F22 at two seconds, 
if you look at this, the only thing sharp here is his faceplate. This beautiful drop on his foreleg isn't sharp. All of this wonderful dew around his eyeball, none of that stuff is sharp. So this is the best picture I can make. This isn't the picture I wanna make. What I wanna make is this picture. Right now I've got all oh, this wonderful depth of field. That wonderful dew is, is sharp. That, that drop on his leg is sharp. Okay, the way I do this is focus stacking. Okay, taking a series of images, all of them at F22, at different focus points throughout this, this insect, and then using a computer program to stack all those, just take the sharp bits of each picture and put them all together to make one sharp picture with depth of field that would be impossible in just one image, right? So this is actually a series of, this is a combination of six pictures. And these are the six pictures that went into making that one image. And you can see up here, this is the, the, the closest. So we, we start off focusing on the closest thing, which is this drop, right? And now you look at the back of his head, that's all unsharp. And you can see the focus migrate back to this final picture here. Now the drops mush. The only thing sharp is back here. So now I take these six pictures. I process them all the same. I use a focus stacking software like Zerine or Helicon or even Photoshop, I think will do it. And I run them through that program. It takes all, all the sharp bits from each one and combines it into one, one sharp picture with, uh, with what was before this impossible depth of field. Okay. Um, and this has really kicked open a lot of creative doors, right? Because back, you know, when we got into to photographing at 3X or 4X, really teeny tiny things, we were relegated to doing flat subjects because we didn't have the depth of field. Now we can really add some depth and, and it's opened up a whole lot of new subjects for, uh, for, for extreme macro photography. So Steve, it's really exciting. Go ahead. Steve, the, I was interested to see that you used F22 while you were focus, uh, photo stacking. Um, other people that I know use the sweet point on their lens. They, they use F8 or something. Because they're actually stacking, they can use the point that they believe is the sharpest on the, on the lens. It's just interesting why you use F20, F22. Um, just because I, I shoot at F22 all the time, and, and I know people will say that you, you get uh, – diffraction and things like that. I honestly, I don't see it. But between you and me, I'm not a big giant pixel peeper. I'm not zooming into every, you know, to 200% to see where things are at. I want it sharp enough that I can send it to my agent. He can print it on a billboard and all's good. You know, and, and the other thing is I can't, it, it, you know, when I'm out in the field with this with a subject, the wind could come up, he could move. So I can't make, you know, I, I hear these people that are stacking hundreds of images and like Levon, I think it's Levon Bliss does this wonderful work where he makes like 15,000 images to make one and it's all in a studio, but it's amazing. Um, so between you and me, I've never made more than 12 images in a stack, all right? And I'm usually shooting at more stop down F stops. And this thing, if you zoom in on it and really look at it, it's pretty good and sharp. Um, so, you know, that's just my method. It may not be the best, the right method or the best method, but it works very well for me. I don't, you know, so, but everybody skins the cat a little differently. Well, it looks good to me, Steve. So it works, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can make anything look good on the internet. So, but it is, it is sharp. When you look at the raw file, it is sharp. You know, if I had done it if, at F8, would it be 6% sharper? Maybe, but is that 6% going to make any difference to me really in the, in the life of that image? Probably not. So, okay. So this has kicked open all kinds of creative doors. Okay. Um, now we can photograph things with depth. This is dew drops on a spider web. This whole thing is about the size of your pinky fingernail. All right. This is just four images focused act. And, um, you know, I'm just trying to get the depth of the drop. Um, and what's going on here is, is you see the flower in each of the drops. The flower is actually behind the dew drops. And those, each of those drops act like a lens to focus the flower in.
Okay, here's another image. This is actually 12 images stacked. Okay, a picture that I've had in my head for a long time, but I, I haven't had the means to make it. What this is, is this is a, a little tiny uh, Eastern tail blue, which is a small little butterfly. It's about the size of your thumbnail. It's got these wonderful antenna that stick way out in front of them. All right, so I'm trying to get a lot of depth from the front of this antenna all the way back to the leading edge of his wings there. So that's why I needed 12 images to do it. Um, but again, it's, there's no way you could do this with, with just one image, right? And again, I'm able to do this out in the field when they're covered with dew like this because they're cool. They're in a state of torpor. They can't move until they warm up enough to be able to get around. Okay, this is a, uh, a mosquito that is just hatched out. So mosquitoes spend, spend the early part of their life as larva underwater. Then when it comes time for them to hatch out, they, they come up to the surface and they extract themselves from the, the larval stage and they get on top of the water, they pump fluid into their wing and then they take off. So that's what this guy's done. He's just hatched out from his larval stage. He's on the surface of the water uh, getting ready to fly off. And they're on the surface of the water for a minute or two maybe. Um, but this is a focus stack. This is a five image focus stack. All right. And here's, so this was actually done on my, uh, on my, whoops, on my kitchen table or kitchen countertop. So here's the setup. Um, so I'm using flash just cause it's a little easier for this to control the lighting here inside the house. So I've got three flash heads on the subject. This is a, a, a just a printed background to give me the green background and the uh give you an idea of scale the mosquitoes in this little aquarium that i built just i took some little tiny pieces of glass and acrylic them all together put the larva in there waited for them to hatch out and then here's my my lens i got a little light here to focus to help me focus so i can see and then this sub this thing right here is something i use for focus stacking this is an automatic stacking rail and um, what this does is it automatically moves the camera to make your stacks instead of moving your focus like the lens I'm using actually doesn't even have a focus ring. So you have to focus by moving it forward and backward. So this does that automatically. This is made by a company called Cognosis. Uh, it's called the stack shot and you just mount it on there. You, you, you go to your image. Let me go back, you go to your image and you pick the, closest thing you want sharp. Okay. So here we're, we're going to make this the starting point of the stack. We're going to focus on that. Then we're going to go and we're going to set that as the starting point. Then we're going to go back here and make this the end point. Okay. So this is how much we're trying to get. Then we tell the, the rail how many images to make. All right. And that kind of comes from experience, but for this one, I made five images. Then we just push the button it's connected to your camera. It moves it back, waits a, a little, a second or two for the vibration to stop, takes a picture, moves it forward exactly one fifth, waits a second, takes a picture and continues to go through till it makes all five images. So makes it a lot easier and very precise, right? I'm not making guesses of, of, uh, of how far to move the, the camera. So lots of fun and making pictures that, that are impossible to make without that technology. How are we doing on questions, Nicole? You actually answered the question about, do you use a focusing rail? So look at me go. Good. I know. Awesome. All righty. All right. So one of the things I'm always trying to do is make the pictures I have in my head. Right? So, uh, I come up with all kinds of different ways to do that, all kinds of crazy inventions to, to get a different perspective or to make different pictures. So um, these are eared grebes, beautiful little grebes are out, out west, out in I think this was North Dakota. But one of the things I love about this picture, again, is that low perspective, right? I put the viewer right in the water with these beautiful birds, right? A super tough and unusual perspective to get the way I do it is by working in my floating blind. <laughs> so Steve's going out to build one of these, aren't you, Steve? Oh, that fool. 
<laughs> so what this is, is it's, it's basically a boat deck with a hole in the middle. I put on a pair of waders. I step in the hole. I mount my camera on the deck. And then I walk out into the pond. I zip this over the top of me and I walk along the bottom of the pond and I'm able to stalk. I'm able to work the light. But more importantly, look how low this lens is. It's just six inches off the, off the, the surface of the water. So I get this beautiful, hard to get perspective of these birds, right? The hard thing is here in Michigan, all the cool birds go through in the winter. So it's kind of cold. You're standing up to your armpits in ice water for eight hours. It's not for the faint of heart, but look at what we can do with it, right? These are uh, a pair of rushing greaves right at eye level, right? Making images not a lot of people are making. All right, this, if you're interested, Steve, this will be in the notes. I'll, I'll tell you exactly how to make it on. There's a, there's a post on our website we'll direct you to. <laughs> oh. All right, picture I had in my head, trying to figure out how, I, how to get pictures I have in my head. Once again, I love this low perspective. We've, we've also added a bonus reflection, right? So here's how I, oops. Wrong button, sorry. Here's how I do it. This is my bird feeder. Okay, this was actually set up for birds. We haven't done a lot of birds with this thing yet. We just built this a few months ago. So, but, but basically what this is, this is a blind. It's recessed down into the ground. I dug a hole. It's, it's four feet down in the ground so we can sit there comfortably. We've got this reflecting pond in front of it. And then we just, this is the stage for our, for our whatever we want to photograph. We put bird seed here, whatever we want to attract up there. And uh, just figuring out ways to get the pictures I have in my head. All right, it's a pine warbler came in, the birds come in, they get drinks, they get baths. Sometimes we'll put seeds down there to attract them in. All right, we had a pair of, uh, or a family of raccoons that mom would bring them by here to get a drink every once in a while. And then, of course, we got to push things a little bit, try to do something, crank it up a notch, get something different. Okay, snowflakes. One day I was, I was walking, uh, living in Michigan, we do get some snow. So I was walking through the woods, and I had a black turtleneck on, and I looked down, and there was a snowflake on it. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, that's the prettiest thing ever. I need to figure out how to how to uh, make a picture of that. So, which was a lot easier to say than it was to actually do. So this is, this is what I came up with to do it. Um, so basically I, I designed and built a microscope to be able to do it. And then um, the lighting was actually the tricky part because you know we can't have any heat, right? And it's, the whole thing has to be outdoors so it's nice and cold. And uh, what I came up with was these fiber optic lights. And these are basically light pipes with, with little light emitting tips that, that will pump a bright light from here all the way up through to the tip of the thing. So that's how I lit it. And oops, I got a new clicker. I don't know how it works yet. Um, so the light's coming up from underneath. And I'll just kind of run through this real quick. The light's coming up from underneath. This is a pair of uh, some milky glass that kind of diffuses the light. And then these two filters, the blue one actually becomes the background. Remember the background of the, of the snowflakes was blue. That's actually from this blue filter. The other light pipe comes up and goes through this red filter and that kicks some highlights and some other tones into the image. These two light pipes from above have a blue and a red filter in them as well. And they also have some toilet paper around them to kind of soften and diffuse the light. And these are adjustable so I can, you know, highlight the individual facets of the, of the snowflakes, right? So that's the lighting. The camera is just a camera. This is nothing but extension. These are just hollow tubes. And then I've got a magnifying objective on the front. And I've got three different objectives for different size snowflakes. So what I would do is I would catch the snowflake on a black piece of, of cloth. If I, if I saw one that looked promising, I had a little paintbrush with just two hairs on it. And I would pick the snowflake up very carefully, put it on a microscope slide and slide it over underneath here and, uh, and start making pictures of it. Okay, super fun, super cool. 
Um, there'll be a, I'll, I'll give you a link to the blog post on how to do this. Um, but really just make some really, really cool images. And today, actually, I think this is in the updated in the blog post. This is a lot easier to do now than it was then because now I could focus stack, right? Back then I couldn't focus stack. I had to do it with one single image and there's no, there's no aperture on this. So your depth of field is exactly one bazillimeter. I mean, there is no, you have to have everything absolutely parallel. So today with focus stacking, this would be a lot easier to do. All right, how are we doing on time? Okay, not too bad. All right, get out of the box, right? Take things to the next level. This is um, one of my favorite things to do is high-speed flash. One of your countrymen absolutely inspired me. Stephen Dalton was doing this back when it was hard, right? I've been doing it since the film days too, but, but he was doing it on a much different level when, when I was there. But I love doing high-speed flash. I love showing people something they can't see with their naked eye, right? So the key to this is I'm lighting this whole thing with six flash heads firing at a very fast, I dial the flashes down to the, the flash duration is one eleven thousandth of a second. That gives me a fast enough flash duration to freeze this action, right? So um, here's the setup, right? The hummingbird comes in here to feed. I've got six lights that I use to four lights on the bird. And then I, I have to use a fake background cause I don't want the background going black. So I light the background with two other lights, the birds. This is my crazy hummingbird feeder. Um, so, and if you come with, with Nicole and I to Ecuador or Costa Rica, we'll, we'll set you up. Everybody who comes with us on one of those trips gets to, gets to spend a good amount of time on this, on one of these set systems to take pictures like this, but it's, it's really cool and really fun. And we're able to show people something they couldn't do. Um, couldn't see with their naked eye. This is from Costa Rica, a fiery throated hummingbird. Okay, I just just uh, used a syringe to put some nectar in this flower and waited for the bird to come and drink from it. All right, here we are in Ecuador. That's a, a violet tailed sylph. And he's flying up to get the, just a beautiful bird, amazing. So the, the more dominant males have longer tails. So this was this was the king of the, of the area, but really the jewels of the avian world. Do we have any questions on this before I move on, Nicole? Yes, from John. Um, John is saying, um, I have used four lights in Costa Rica and Ecuador, but I am wondering if you need them now. We have mirrorless cameras with one thirty-two thousand speed. Sure. If you can get, you know, the, the trick with that is getting the depth of field. So, you know, I'm able to do this at like F16. So I get all that depth of field. You know, I mean, look, it's, it's changing when eventually we're going to come to the point where we're just doing videos and taking out a, a, a single frame uh, uh, from a video to, to get a, an image. I mean, that's, that's absolutely going to be coming down the pike in the next decade or so. So everything's changing, but I still think this has a lot of benefits that, that make it worthwhile um, over just cranking up the ISO and, and shooting a super fast shutter speed. But absolutely, it is common. And I don't, you know, I haven't done it with natural light in a long time, so I can't really speak to that. Okay, and then we have a question from, I think, Mary, who's uh, typing through Graham, um, asking, what's your hit rate like? On the hummingbirds? I think so. Uh, a surprising, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of spray and pray, right? You know, you just, you take a lot of pictures, but you're looking for that wing position. You're looking for, and, and the hit rate is better than you think. You know, mm -hmm. we have people that will, will sit on the thing for a couple hours and, and think they haven't gotten a picture and they come back and they got 30, right? So mm -hmm. you, you just, it, you know, it's, it's, getting shots like this is actually significantly pretty easy if you're if you know what you're doing and you're focused right but you're just sitting there waiting and you just take a bunch of pictures and you're looking for that special wing position that special position so mm -hmm. you know you take in a couple hours you'll take 2000 pictures you'll keep 300 and you'll have 20 amazing ones so you know it's not bad it's a pretty good return on investment are you manually focusing for, for this? I do manually focus, yep. So, whoops. 
So what I do is, is I actually don't even look through my camera. Right. So I'm focused on, I pre-focus on the flower. Then I watch around the side of my camera. And when I see the hummingbird come in, cause you can't time it for right when his wings are there, you just take a, a picture and you get what you get. So I kind of watch along side to side, everything's pre-focused and I just bang one off when they're in there. Yeah. So high speed flash is something I play with a lot. Whoops. This new clicker is killing me. Now oh, I can't do anything. Um, all right, so this is a, uh, a skullcap fungus. They release, they reproduce by releasing spores in a mushroom cloud, right? So I use high-speed flash to freeze those spores as they came out. Just two flashes, right? One on the left, one on the right. Um, lighten this up and uh, pretty cool effect. All right, this is an archer fish, just an amazing little animal. Um, these guys, they're, they're from Asia and they actually eat terrestrial insects. And they, they capture these insects, they squirt a super fast pulse of water at the insect, knock it down into the water, and then they swim over and eat it. So I saw that, I'm like, oh my gosh, I gotta figure out how to photograph that. So that led me down to this. So this is the setup for the archer fish. So I, I actually got one. You can get these at the aquarium store. So I got a fish. I set up a little tank and uh, I trained the fish to, to eat. I would put a, a spider or something on here and he would come over and he would, he would gladly eat it and do his thing. And then it's just, it's four lights. I got two lights on the bird, on the fish, and then two lights on the background. I have to use a fake background. Um, but, uh, Super fun project, super cool, neat story to tell. It's, it's the, uh, the thought of you standing over the fish with a whiplash trying to train it is just uh, <laughs> cracking me up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you know what? I use a, a more positive reinforcement method of training. I give them food. <laughs> There's no, no fish were injured in the making of this, of this image, Steve. <laughs> oh, fine. You know, same copy set of the ants. <laughs> well, there you go. There, yeah, that's it's a whole different perspective from the ants' perspective. You're right. Yeah. Okay. Now, another thing we can do is we can add an infrared trigger to fire our camera, so then we can get precise timing. All right, and that's what I did here. This is a little set I built uh, in my studio. Here's the set. I think. Yeah. Here's the set. Right, and I've I've got I've got four flashes on it. In the end, I liked the black background. I put a piece of black velvet over. Um, so, but there's a trigger right here, and this trigger shoots out a beam. The frog is on this rock. He jumps out. When he jumps, he breaks the beam. The beam is is fire is is uh, hooked up to our camera. When he breaks the beam, it fires the camera, fires the flash, and makes the picture. Right, that way I've got more control. I can pre precisely control exactly when the when the camera goes off and get exactly the frame I want. Right, and we can do that for all kinds of things. Right, anything that's moving in a straight in a predictable path, we can put a beam in front of it and figure out a way to make the picture of. Okay, this is a bluebird uh, in a nest box that I have that we had in our yard, exiting the nest. Okay, and here's, this is the setup for that. Same exact thing, we're using a different beam. Again, these are by Cognosis, this is called the stop shot, this, or this is called the saber. All right, shooting a beam up in front of, this is my, my uh, natural nest cavity, right? And this is all kind of weird, because I don't know if you, you remember the picture, I wanna get this top shot, right? The pretty part of a bluebird is the top part. So I wanna shoot from above. So everything's kind of angled up here. My camera is actually off here to the left, about 20 feet off the ground, right? I've got three flashes on the bird, a flash for a, a, to give a little rim lighting, and then a fake background lit by these two flash beams here. Bird flies out of the, out of the nest box, trips the beam, fires the flashes, makes the picture, All right? And you can do that with anything that's moving in a predictable path, like flying squirrels. Do you guys have flying squirrels in, in Britain? No? No, we don't. Yeah. 
Well, you'll come over here. We'll, we'll, we'll help you photograph them over here. Beautiful. These are the coolest little creatures. They're so friendly. They, you know, like I, I work with these guys for a couple months and they're just, they just, they're so tame and so docile. They would just come up and, and lick your, lick peanut butter off your finger. They were so neat. Okay. So here's the, uh, the setup for this shot. So this is actually the setup for the next shot here where he's flying over the top. All right. But so again, I'm using high speed flash. I got three flashes. Here's my beam shooting up and I'm up high. Cause I want to get the shot when he's flying, they're flying off from camera left flying off. They break the beam and that's where I take the picture. All right. And I just use this tray to train them. I just would go out there every night at dusk, put a handful of seeds until they, they finally got used to it and they just fly over there every night. Super fun project. Super cool. Just amazing little creatures. Okay. Here's uh this is a, a dog faced bat uh, in flight again, using high speed flash and triggers. Um, for this particular image, um, I was asked, there's a, a bat conservation area here in, in Michigan, and they asked me to, to work with them to make some images so they could promote their message. And, and so we worked together with, with bats that they had at their facility. So for this particular shot, we, uh, we, used, we made a flight tunnel. Okay, so here's the flight tunnel here. The bats would be released in the short, the, the, the small end over here, and they would just naturally fly right through this opening. And here's my beam shooting across here. When they fly through, they'd break the beam, fire the camera, which would fire the flashes and make the pictures. Okay. And for the shot, for this shot here, for this shot here, we, uh, we obviously put some, some plants around it to make it look like it was in a jungle or something like this. Right. But you could very easily do this around uh, a barn opening, right? Uh, uh, you know, if there's bats roosting in the barn, find out what window they're flying out and set this up in front of that. You could do it in front of a natural cave or a church belfry or something like that. Any place bats are roosting, you could set this up very easily. This is a pretty easy shot to do. Okay, similar situation here. Um, but these are, these are wild bats in Arizona. Bats drink on the wing. They actually fly down over the water. They drop their, their lower mandible in, scoop up some water. So all we did is we put a beam in front of the pond with some flashes. And when they flew down, they broke the beam, fired the flashes, and made the images. Okay. How are we doing on questions, Nicole? No questions right now. <laughs> okay, we've got one more section to go, short section. All right, now, can you believe it? We're gonna go even further out of the box. So, and I'm sure Steve's probably got one of these at home. Of course. <laughs> You've got two, don't you? You're just being modest. So this is a device that I made to photograph moths in flight. All right, um, and it's, it's using, uh, there's a high speed shutter on the front of the lens. These are actually laser beams um, because laser beams are a little more precise for smaller things. Um, and this is the control box for the whole thing. We've got two high speed flashes. These flashes are dialed way down. These flashes are now firing at a 25,000th of a second. So super fast because we got smaller insects, faster wings. We need more. We need more. Uh, more speed to stop that. So what I did was I I put a moth light above this, just a, a regular light, and the moths would come in at night and they would fly around that light just like moths do. Every once in a while, so these two laser beams they form an X, and that X is right in front of this lens, right? So as they flew around, every once in a while, one would fly right through the X. And he, when he flew through the X, he would break both beams at the same time. The, the system would only fire if both beams were broken, right? That way I knew the moth was in exactly the right spot. Fly around, fly around, break both beams. At once both beams were broken, oops, see, I jumped ahead of myself. I stole my thunder. Um, once both beams were broken, the, uh, the camera would be open on bulb. The, uh, 
the, the controller would turn off the laser beams, it would open this high-speed shutter and fire these two flashes and make pictures like this, like this. Dang it. Make pictures like that, right, of this moth in flight. How cool is that? So and this thing would just, I, I'd set this thing up at night and let it do its thing. In the morning I would get up and, and see, I'm actually very lazy. I just let my cameras do all the work. That's why I like these triggers, right? So pictures like this, this is actually a firefly, right? Flying at night. So I thought, well, that's cool. What else can I do with this thing? I thought, you know what I could do? I could do bees. So I set this thing up, this whole contraption in front of a beehive. When the bees flew out of the hive, they dropped down and flew right through my beam and took their own pictures. So I thought, well, geez, that's really neat. I would like to do more daytime flying insects. So that led me down this rabbit hole, right? So this is my setup to photograph daytime flying insects. So it's basically the exact same thing as the, the nighttime flying insects, except for I can't get the, the insects to fly where I want. So I had these different acrylic boxes and you can see I've got three different size ones for different size insects. And I've got the laser beams going across, making a plus sign inside the box, right? I catch an insect, I put it inside there. The insect flies around, flies around. Every once in a while, he flies right through the center of both of those laser beams. Those are right in front of the lens, okay? The controller back here turns off the laser beams because we don't want laser beams in our picture, opens up the high-speed shutter, fires the flashes. Now, because I want to give the impression of daylight, I have to light a background, right, to give it the impression that they're out, out in the field takes a picture and we end up, oops, with pictures like this, right? And I've only, this we, we I just set this up and I was only able to work with it for a week. So I, it's kind of just getting, getting our, our legs under us with this, but um, it's got a lot of potential. That's a, a little ecumen moss, wasp. He's maybe a half an inch, three quarters of an inch long, teeny tiny little thing. And that is my story. So um, I don't know how we're doing on time. Oh, we're not doing bad on time. So uh, we can take questions. Uh, if you guys have any questions about any topic about photography, if you want, or uh, I don't know why this isn't going anymore. Um, I was just... Go fascinated, ahead. Steve, by the um, the way that you use technology to uh, capture these stunning images that you wouldn't be able to do it any other way, uh, especially that last set that we got there of the um, the, ins the daytime insects. I mean, they're just absolutely stunning. Thank you. Yeah, and, thanks very um, much. But obviously, um, you're a man who understands how to use all of this equipment. And you use the term vision to put it all together to actually work out how to use it to get it. Because if I had all that technology that you've got, I hate to think what would it, it would look like and, and how long it would take me to get a result out of it. You'd um, be surprised. Guess, it's gradual years, steps. Yeah, it, it's gradual steps. You know, I, I didn't start <laughs> off with that final thing. I started <laughs> off with f stops and shutter speeds, right? And then we just you know, it all grows upon itself. I, cause I, I don't really, well, I guess I am kind of a nerd. I'd have to say I am a bit of a nerd. I actually realized I'm a nerd when I was climbing up on my roof to put my weather station up. <laughs> I, um, I echoing um, Ralph's words there. Absolutely stunning, Steve. Um, thank you. I'm in awe, humbled. Hmm. Hopefully inspired. Oh, that as well, but you've got to be, <laughs> yeah. You've got to be inspired. You've got to start from somewhere fairly low. And that's where I am at the moment compared to you. But absolutely inspirational. Very, very good. Thank you yeah. very much. Excellent. We do have one question from John asking, oh, now we have another one too. Um, what was the trigger, the saber? The trigger. Okay, so um, 
we work with a company called Cognosis. They're actually here in Michigan and they make really amazing stuff. When I first started doing this, this stuff, was, like when Stephen Dalton was doing it, this stuff was crazy hard. Like you had to invent triggers. You had to trick your flashes to work fast. Now there's companies like Cognosis that are making this equipment that make it so much easier. So the company's called Cognosis, C-O-G-N-I-S-Y-S. We'll put this in the notes. We'll put a link in the notes. They make the most fantastic stuff. They make the stack shot that we talked about. They make two different triggers. The, the trigger that, that I use, the best one for me is the Sabre, which is, I think it's less than $400. What I like about that one, they also make a, a one that's half the price that will work for a lot of the pictures. But the beauty of the Sabre is it will manage your flash and your camera. So for that nighttime stuff, it, it really works well. It's a Sabre, S-A-B-R-E. But we'll put all that stuff in the notes for you. So, and then... Cognosis, they also make the stop, the laser trigger that I used. They make a whole system. If you're interested in doing water drops, they make a wonderful system for photographing water drops. It just makes it brainless. It times the drops and it's, just, it's crazy. They make really cool toys. Um, then we have a question from David asking, how do you fix the point of focus when you make your setup for the daylight insect flight? So I focus right where the beam is. Okay, because because so without getting too technical into this, there's actually a delay, right? The signal from the 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 beam goes to your camera at the speed of light. That happens instantaneously, but your camera has to wake up. It has to do a meter reading. It has to move the mirror up and make the exposure. There's a delay there, so we have to bypass that delay. So we put a high speed shutter on the front of the camera that trips instantaneously, it trips in five milliseconds. The, the, the shutter's open, the mirror's up on the camera. So as soon as that shutter open, that high-speed shutter opens up, it exposes it, then it shuts back down, right? So we need to get over that delay. So by doing that, we focus right where the beam is because the instant that thing breaks both beams, it's gonna fire the, open the shutter and make the exposure. Cool. All right, and then Gary says, amazing, thanks. Must get to Costa Rica with you. Oh, yeah, that'd be fun. That yeah, be Costa Rica is one of my favorite places. There's so yeah. much to do in Costa Rica. Yeah, the, you know, poison dart frogs and birds and hummingbirds and sloths. And yeah, and the people are yeah. just amazing in Costa Rica. Really fun. Really happy to, to share their country with you. Um, 21. <laughs> well, another question from me, Steve. Um, when you're using six flashes, how do you set the levels on the individual flashes? Are you using them as a group? Do they um, work through the lens or are they set manually? No, so the flashes are all set manually and you control the amount of light by moving the flashes closer or further away, right? But they're all set on manual and they're all set at 1 16th power which gives us one eleven thousandth of a second flash duration. And that super fast pulse of light is what freezes the action. And then we can control how much light goes on our subject by moving them closer or farther away, right? So, so when I set everything up like that, usually I'm shooting like ISO 200 to 200th of a second at F16. So we got lots of depth of field, lots of light, and uh, all, that, all that action stopping speed. All right, I think that's all our questions. Okay, so, yeah. so you guys were awesome. Thanks to Steve and Ralph for, for putting this together. You yeah, got us a great you. group of, group of photographers. Great questions. You guys, obviously, you guys know your stuff there. I appreciate you hanging out for us. Sorry, that time change threw us for a loop. Yeah. So, <laughs> no, so we appreciate your patience. Now, uh, again, stunning evening, Steve, Nicole. Thank you so much for approaching us. And um, I have to admit... I was getting very nervous when we had four people <laughs> uh, because I did promise an excess of 70. And mm -hmm. I, I think we reached that, didn't we? Rick? You, you yeah, absolutely yeah. delivered. Yeah, and, and oh, those you. poor 70 people, they were all hitting refresh, refresh, <laughs> refresh. I, that, was, that was our fault. I, I apologize. So thank you very much. Yeah. doesn't matter. We got there and it was all worth waiting for. Thank you very so good. much. Thank you so much. Thank and you. we will get those notes out. We, we're, we got to put them together a little bit yet, put some polish on them, but we'll get those out in the next couple of days. We use MailChimp to send out the notes. So 
Um, you know, sometimes they'll go in a promotions folder once in a great while they'll go in your spam folder, but we'll get those out to everybody and they'll give you a lot more detail and a lot more deeper dive into some of the things we talked about. So, yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah, well, Take care. Yeah. Well, both of you, thanks very much. And, um, I think the notes are uh, a massive bonus on top of a, a fantastic evening. So thanks again. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Cheers. Yeah. Thank thanks. You. Cheers, bye -bye. Guys. Yeah. Bye bye. Cool. bye. Okay, you have to you have to close the meeting, Nicole, because oh. you opened up. Oh, it's oh. late. Like, it's like a power. <laughs> <laughs> See you. Bye bye. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah.